Hello, and welcome to Animation Wars, where we decide if animated movies belong on the light side of the force or the dark side. Hey, I hope you had a happy Halloween. Yeah, I know the costumes are in the clearance bins now, but we're still within the window of Halloween, right? We can still have a Halloween review, right? Okay, I wanted to get this review out at Halloween, but real life and technical difficulties prevented that, so I'm sorry. Anyway, this review is a bit different than usual since it wasn't chosen by me. It was chosen by the people. I put a poll up on my DeviantArt page and let people vote on what they wanted me to review next, and the winner was... Corpse Bride! I love democracy. Now, some people call this movie Tim Burton's attempt to cash in on his Nightmare Before Christmas success, but I'm going to be seeing how this movie holds up on its own. Let's begin, as usual, with a light side point. The animation. Dear God, I love, love, love stop-motion animation, especially when it's maxed to its fullest creepy potential. This movie creates two separate and completely unique worlds. The harsh, nearly colorless world of the living, and the zany, upbeat world of the dead. From the very beginning, when a butterfly is the only splash of color to be seen among these weirdly shaped people who are barely moving, you know you're in for a visual treat. Movies like this really capture how stop motion can be both unsettling and fascinating, and it's something that no other animation style can really replicate. Of course, visuals aren't the only thing a movie needs in order to be great, but fortunately, another light side point is the characters. Emily the Corpse Bride has to be one of the most unique animated heroines in history. Being dead, she's able to look at the world with a sense of serenity and a wry sense of humor, but she also has a full range of human emotions. She carries this aura of innocence about her, but she also buries the pain of having been literally left for dead. She's just so lovable. Who would have thought a dead character could have so much life in her? Meanwhile, Victor is so adorable the way he's so awkward around girls and how he doesn't always know quite what to do. Sure, you might get mad at him when he lies to Emily in order to escape the land of the dead, but then again, he has just found himself married to a dead woman. You'd probably want to get out of there, too. As for Victoria, she's not as interesting as the other two leads, but she still demonstrates determination and passion, even though she's been raised in such a strict environment. As for the side characters, the spider and maggot are cute despite their species. The two sets of parents are hilarious in their assholery, and Victor's dead dog Scraps manages to be cute even though he's a skeleton. Imagine that. Also, I find it interesting that all three of Tim Burton's stop-motion movies have a dead dog character. I'm sure there's a story behind that. Anyway, all the more minor characters are still so freaking memorable. They all have unique designs, unique ways of moving, and awesome lines. Even the skeleton singer is awesome, which leads us to our next light side point, the songs. Danny Elfman, people! Danny Elfman! While there are only four songs, each one of them is super memorable and its own mini-masterpiece. The opening song, According to Plan, provides a hilarious introduction to Victor, Victoria, and their corresponding families, with some really clever lyrics. Remains of the Day is such a fun, visually stunning number, and it's one of Danny Elfman's most catchy songs ever. And that's an accomplishment when you consider that the song's about Emily being murdered. Tears to Shed is weird, but it still gets you really feeling sorry for Emily and how she's lost so much, and still is capable of feeling heartbreak after death. Finally, there's the wedding song, which, simply put, is a masterwork of harmonies. It would be right at home on the Broadway stage. Now, while this movie has a whole lot to love, there is still, of course, a dark side point, which is Lord Barkus's lost potential. The movie's villain, Lord Barkus, has a really creepy presence and could have been awesome, except he just doesn't have enough development for the awesomeness to happen. He courted Emily and killed her, and he's also planning to court Victoria and kill her, so... Does that mean he's done this to other women? Is he like some bluebeard who marries women and then kills them? That could be cool, but we don't know for certain if this is the case. 
Also, what really does him in for me is, well, what does him in? Spoiler alert, he's killed by his own stupidity. Seriously, he drinks a glass of wine that is conveniently poisoned, and he doesn't have any real reason to drink it. He just seems to drink it because it's there. Really, he should know that if you find a glass of wine lying around in a room full of dead people, it might not be a good idea to drink it. Sure, he's a memorable character, everyone in this movie is, but he just doesn't reach his potential. Anyway, the spoiler alerts continue for our last slight side point. It's not afraid to be bittersweet. Love triangles are difficult to handle in fiction, even more so when one of the participants in the love triangle is dead. But I would actually say this is one of the better love triangles in any movie I've ever seen. Victor seems to develop genuine feelings for both Victoria and Emily, and he has good chemistry with both of them, and he doesn't come across as a jerk for it. Well, okay, he does come across as a jerk when he lies to Emily about his reasons to go to the living world, but like I said, it's understandable, and he does acknowledge that it was wrong. Besides, later on he becomes so fond of her that he's actually willing to die to be with her. The first time I saw this movie, I seriously didn't know which one he was going to end up with. The movie also doesn't have a conventional happy ending. Sure, Victor and Victoria live and end up together, but Emily must move on. Yeah, she's dead already, and it's implied that her spirit goes to heaven or whatever, but still, you can't help but feel sad for her. Her happiness in life was taken away, and in death, she gives up that happiness once again. In conclusion, this movie might not be quite as good as The Nightmare Before Christmas, but it's still freaking awesome. It's charming, it's moving, it's entertaining, it's visually stunning. Wow. It should come as no surprise when I declare it property of The Light Side. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this Halloween episode that was voted on by the people. Now, Animation Wars is going on hiatus for a couple of months. Why? Well, later this month I'm publishing a novel. Keep your eyes out for more news about that later. And in December, we have The Rise of Skywalker, bitches! When that movie comes out, I will be posting some Star Wars videos! Yeah! So, Animation Wars will return in January, and until then, may the animation be with you.